Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special session uh, with a very special person. Tim Geithner is, of course, the Secretary of Treasury of the United States. We're going to do this because it will be on, on uh, television as well uh, in a slightly different format where we're going to have a conversation, then open it up to questions. Uh, so if you could just, uh, if you, for those of you who watch the Republican debates, hold your applause and your boos. Uh, so if he says something particularly controversial, <laughs> don't, uh, don't boo. Um, it's a great pleasure to have Timothy Geithner, the Secretary of the Treasury, on. Nice to see you, Fareed. Let me start with a, an easy question. What is the United States economy going to grow at this year? You know, there are no oracles in, in economics, uh, and it's still a pretty uncertain world. But I think the conventional view of the U.S. now is that we're growing between 2 and 3%. And uh, I think that's a realistic outcome for the United States economy as long as we see a little more progress in Europe uh, and as long as we don't see a lot of risk come uh, from Iran on the oil front. The, that, that scenario of 2 to 3% growth uh, seems a little different from what Ben Bernanke thinks growth is going to look like. If you read the statement the Fed put out, it was a very bearish statement. I mean, to, to be w willing to almost guarantee that rates will be kept where they are until the end of 2014 suggests they don't see any growth, of any, any robust growth for a long time. Are, are they wrong at the Fed? Well, you know, I'm not a forecaster, so uh, my view is not, not worth much. But I think actually if you look at the, uh, both the Fed's forecast and the consensus of private forecasters in the business community among economists, uh, people are pretty closely clustered in that, in that area. But, it, but it's still very dependent on how the world unfolds. Uh, again, I think it's worth recognizing that you know, we still face uh, tremendous challenges as a country. We're still uh, repairing the damage caused by a devastating financial crisis that still has huge lasting uh, impact on the basic fortunes of most Americans. Unemployment is still very high. Uh, Housing is still very, very weak. Construction is very weak. Uh, people still have too much debt, uh, they're bringing that down, and uh, that's still going to take a while to uh, repair. That crisis came on top of a decade, as you know, where we saw virtually no growth in median income, uh, very high levels of poverty uh, in this country, very high levels of inequality, uh, and a erosion in people's confidence in their mobility, their, their prospects over time. And on top of that, of course, we, we, we face a more challenging world. Uh, you know, just last year, the combined effects of oil, Japan, and the crisis in Europe were, and, and, the, and, the, and the damage, the debt limit debate caused the United States to confidence. Those things were very, very damaging, and they slowed growth everywhere around the world at a time when, again, the world was still, still healing. So we have a lot of challenges ahead in the United States, uh, and we're working very hard to try to lay the foundation for the political consensus is going to need, it's going to make progress in those things uh, possible. You know, there is a very well established narrative now among the business community in the United States that there would be a much more robust recovery. The U.S. economy would be growing much more vigorously if there were greater certainty and businesses could invest. And the reason they are not is a kind of tsunami of regulations, uh, uncertainty about tax policy, uncertainty about the deficit. But perhaps above all, the sense that, uh, that the economy is being uh, thrown, uh, the, this huge new wave of regulations in healthcare and finance and energy, and that that's what's keeping the economy back. Uh, I, I don't think there's much basis for that view, although uh, it is true that we are putting in place very tough reforms in the financial sector. We're trying to improve how the U.S. healthcare system works, and we're trying to change how Americans use energy. And those are necessary, desirable, very important long-term reforms to the United States. But I think if you look at the evidence we have about how the economy is doing and how the business community is doing in particular, the reality does not justify that sense. Uh, so just look at the things you can use to measure basic health, business health. You know, uh, profitability across the American economy in the business is very, very high. Profits are higher than the pre-crisis peak. If you look at investment as a measure of confidence, private investment in equipment and software is up more than 30% uh, since the trough uh, 
in the first half of 2009. Exports are up 23%. Uh, There's broad-based strength in energy, in agriculture, in manufacturing, not just high-tech manufacturing, but even heavy manufacturing. I was in, at a Siemens plant, new plant in the United States and North Carolina this week, which is building steam and gas turbines and generators and for export. And they're doing that because they see in the basic fundamentals of productivity in the United States, even with all our challenges, a uh, pretty compelling competitive advantage relative to where else they produce. Um, so I think if you look at the basic health of the American business sector, it's much stronger than I think anybody would have thought at the peak of our crisis, and stronger than, um, uh, than many of us uh, hoped. What's holding the U.S. economy back still is the echoes aftershocks of the financial crisis, the damage that's done to, uh, to the household sector, to housing and construction, and uh, the fiscal pressures on state and local governments in particular, which are a drag on growth globally. That combined with the shocks we saw globally is why growth has not been stronger uh, than it has been. But I, I really don't think we could have realistically delivered a better outcome for the American business sector than has happened. And although we recognize that these reforms are tough and they're going to change the economics of business in this case, we think their overall effect on the economy is still going to be positive long term. And we think there's no, I don't think there's any basis for evidence that uh, the impact of those things are hurting growth now. I'll just give you an example. The, the Heritage Foundation, which is a Republican think tank, one of the, one of the well, strongest critics of the impact of regulation so far, estimates the costs uh, could be $20 billion over time. That's a dramatic exaggeration of the potential costs. But remember, we're a $14 trillion economy. And I think on the evidence we have, profitability what the markets think about future profit growth uh, and how companies are behaving, I don't think there's, uh, there's any merit to that argument. While business profitability is up, productivity is up, uh, unemployment still remains a huge challenge. And many businesses ha have become more productive because they've taken costs out of the system, they've managed very efficiently. How do you get the American jobs machine going again? Well. Um, the biggest driver of how fast the unemployment rate comes down is how fast we grow. And the biggest determinant of how fast we grow now is really going to depend on these two fundamental factors. One is what happens in the world, meaning in Europe and in the Gulf, and because of oil. And frankly, just to be direct about it, whether Republicans in Congress decide they want to legislate things that are good for growth in the short term. So that what we think the right economic agenda for the country is, is for us to legislate a set of investment incentives, investments in things that matter for long-term growth, rebuilding America's infrastructure, more education, more spending on innovation, basic science and research, better skills for Americans, tied to long-term fiscal reforms that restore sustainability. And if we were able to legislate progress on those things in the short term, that would make a big difference for confidence. It would make a difference for the, fat, the rate of growth of the American economy in the, short run, in the short run. But to be realistic, it's going to take a long time still for us to fully repair the damage, particularly unemployment, that, that came as a cause of the crisis. But the private sector has created 3.2 million jobs since job growth resumed. That's actually pretty strong job growth in the private sector compared to the last two recoveries. And it's pretty strong given the aftershocks of the crisis. We all want it to be stronger, though. But the fundamental reality is uh, how fast we grow is going to depend on those two factors. Is Europe successful in stabilizing the crisis in Europe? Uh, and can we help build the political foundation in the United States for the type of pro-growth investments uh, tied to long-term fiscal reforms that are the obvious imperative for, the, for our future? You negotiated with the Republicans. Do you think there's any chance that they would pass some of the things the president talked about in the State of the Union? I think you have to wait and see. I think you know, they're, they're talking a little bit about infrastructure now for the first time. Uh, they've said they're going to pass this payroll tax cut, of course, which has a positive but, but modest impact on, on income, which is important. Uh, we feel like there's a compelling case for a targeted set of investment incentives that would be good for improving the economics of investing and building the United States. Uh, 
Those things have not typically been uh, partisan issues. They've had very broad support among Republicans in the past. And, you know, our view is there's nothing standing in the way of progress on those things, even if it's going to take some time to work out the bigger fights on tax reform and entitlements. But that's a calculation they have to make. Uh, Most people who look at the American tax code, which is with regulations and rules, 10,000 pages, one of the most complicated in the world, um, believe that the key to reforming the tax code is broaden the base, eliminate deductions and loopholes, lower rates. Isn't the president's proposal in the State of the Union taking us in exactly the opposite direction? Not at all. In fact, uh, I don't think you're going to see, well, let me put it, let me do it differently. The president's proposals, which are focused on a set of investment favorable reforms in the corporate tax system, manufacturing and investment, and on a modest but necessary increase in the effective tax rate paid by the richest Americans, those two things are only going to come, I think, realistically in the context of broad reform. And what we're trying to do is lay the foundation for tax reform so that we can produce a more simple system, lower rates, broader base, more simple, less distortions. Why not just propose tax reform? Well, uh, and because I think you, you have to start with principles for a framework. And what we're trying to do is to be specific with which areas we think should dominate the debate. So, again, I wish it were different for us, but the, the basic crude fiscal realities of the United States now, and we have to recognize we have to govern within those limits, means that when we do tax reform, we're going to have to be helping contribute to deficit reduction. We don't have the ability of offering the American people or the American business people community a, a net tax cut. That is beyond uh, the capacity of anybody realistic about our constraints. Um, it is also true that fundamental to any resolution of those long-term fiscal problems is going to have to be a modest increase in the effective tax rate again of the richest Americans. And the balance of, uh, of pain and adjustment and burden that's going to have to come is going to come with those tax reforms and individuals combined with uh, some pretty substantial changes in the trajectory of growth and benefits that will affect many middle class Americans. Realistically, that's what's going to come over time. But it's not going to come without figuring out how to uh, change that basic constraint Republicans have put on the American economic policy debate. And I think if you listen carefully, it's, it's, it's starting to change. Uh, if you look at polls, polls are not very reliable in economic policy as a guide to economic policy, but majority of Republicans now, majority of independents, very strong majorities uh, support a long-term fiscal reform package that has as part of it an increase in the effective tax rate for the richest Americans. That, that helps a lot. And if, again, if you listen carefully, you're seeing Democrats uh, show more pragmatism and realism and creativity in recognizing that our, uh, our long-term entitlement commitments are unsustainable. And you're going to need both. But again, to be realistic, we're going to have, we're going to have a big debate on those basic choices. And it's unlikely we're going to make significant progress on those things ahead of the election. Those problems aren't going to go away. And at the end of this year in the United States, you know that the expiry of a bunch of tax cuts and the impact of an automatic cuts in spending are going to be a big motivator to trying to make progress on the fiscal front going forward. But Again, just to put it in perspective, our fiscal problems are daunting for us in the long run, but they are much more manageable problems than faced by almost any major economy around the world. And it's important not to lose sight of the fact that uh, given, given the high level unemployment, given the uh, very bad outcomes for median income in the United States over the last 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, given the just appallingly high rates of poverty in the United States, given the competitive challenges we face, it's going to require pretty significant investments in infrastructure and education, innovation. You have to take a, a much broader approach. And we're not going to solve our problems as a country by thinking they're uh, centrally about how we restore fiscal sustainability. That's part of it. Uh, uh, but. Uh, it's not the dominant challenge we face as a country uh, now. And we have, the, we have the luxury, 
because we're in a relatively strong position despite our challenges, for doing this over a period of several years, uh, not just a period of weeks and months. When you look at your, uh, Mr. Secretary, you look at the growth projections that are coming out, um, and they are all lower than were projected, which means that the deficits are larger, which means that the debt to GDP is larger. Uh, the debt to GDP is larger in almost every case, not because the debt has gone up, but because the GDP has gone down. That is the, not that the numerator has gone up, but the denominator has shrunk. Does that suggest that austerity is not a path to growth? I think the debate about austerity and stimulus uh, is um, mostly divorced from a much more practical reality. The proponents of stimulus, I think, today now realistic are, are um, probably exaggerate its power and its reach now. And I think the people who talk about economic problems is mostly problems you can solve with austerity uh, get the big things wrong. It is true, however, though, for parts of Europe, for a long period of time, there's going to be no alternative to very substantial uh, adjustment in budget deficits in the size of the commitments governments made. There is no alternative to that. For those to work, however, they need some support and some financing, and they need to be complemented by reforms that are also helpful for growth and competitiveness over time. And, but, but they will not work if there's not uh, a stronger commitment of financial resources standing behind the European endeavor. And without that, those reforms will never work. And you're right, countries will face the risk that every disappointment in growth will be met with a austerity that will feed the decline. And that's a cycle you have to arrest if you solve financial crises. Europe's making some progress, though. And I, and I think that um, I think over the, last, over the last two months in particular, they're laying the foundations for a more credible framework. They're making progress on reforms. They're changing the institutions of Europe to put better discipline on fiscal policy. Uh, you have three new governments. Um, doing some very tough things. You have, a, uh, you have an ECB doing what central banks have to do. You see them move to try to strengthen and stand behind the financial sector. But the, I think the Europeans recognize the sort of unfinished piece of that framework is building a stronger, more credible firewall, because without that, you'll be caught in that trap that you referred to. But if you need a stronger and more credible firewall, at the end of the day, there's no, there are only so many funds. And one proposal has been to get the IMF more involved and to ask the IMF to draw lines of credit from its existing members, um, and particularly, obviously, it would be the United States, but it would be China, which is sitting on $3 trillion of foreign exchange reserves. The news reports say that the United States is not enthusiastic about this proposal. Is that true? Uh, well, let me describe our position for you, and I think it's a reasonable position, and I think it has very broad-based support uh, even in Europe. Uh, our view is that the only way Europe's going to be successful in holding this together, making monetary union work over the long run, is for them to build a stronger firewall as a complement to the rest of the comprehensive strategy they have. And that's going to require a bigger commitment of resources. And I think that my sense is the Europeans recognize that. And they know that's the sort of unfinished piece of this framework for the moment. And they're going to have to fix that. If Europe is able and willing to do that, then we believe the IMF can play a supportive, constructive role. It can't substitute, though, for the absence of that European commitment. So if Europe is able to find the political will consensus to build a more effective firewall, then I think you're going to see the IMF and the major shareholders in the IMF and the emerging economies uh, very supportive of trying to reinforce those efforts, uh, but not as a substitute for a more effective European response. You were in China recently. Um, I'm guessing you talked about many things, but two among them, Chinese support for sanctions on Iran. Uh, it seems as though the Chinese are willing to cooperate much more than they have in the past on this issue. Uh, is it your sense that in the next year uh, there will be a, a, a tightening noose, as it were, on Iran? I absolutely think so. I think even over the last um, six months, eight months, two months, few weeks, you're seeing a, a substantial intensification 
of not just the financial sanctions, but a broader effort to wean the world of the dependence on Iranian oil, those countries that use Iranian oil. And my sense is also that uh, China wants to be part of that effort because China views it as very much in China's interest not to see Iran um, undo the delicate balance of uh, power there is in, in the Gulf. Uh, but you know we'll have to see. We're still at the uh, we're still at the early stage of this next wave of intensified financial pressure, both on oil and the financial side. And we're seeing. I'm actually quite encouraged by this the extent of the support we're getting uh, from Europe. Of course, Europe's been uh, been excellent on this, and um, major emerging economies, Japan, and I think China as far as we can tell now, want to be part of this effort and don't want to undermine it. If, if the price of oil goes up and Iran does not make significant concessions, wouldn't it be fair to say the policy has failed because you will have created a situation that actually strengthens Iran with the higher oil prices and at the end of the day they haven't made any concessions? Well, again, what we're all engaged in, and again, this is an international effort that's very broad support, is trying to maximize the incentives we create for Iran to, to uh, <laughs> alter their nuclear ambitions, to deter them from their nuclear ambitions. And that is the most important thing, not just for the broad strategic interest we have in stability in the region, uh, but also for the security of energy supplies are important to so many countries around the world. And that's why we're finding so much support in building pressure. One final question. When you were in China, did you talk about U.S.-China trade in a way that you think you will see results? Because the president in his State of the Union was pretty tough on China. Um, do you think that there is a path here, a constructive path forward? Well, again, we'll have to see. You know, we measure people by their actions. Uh, and, you know, China does present a pretty, a really unique and formidable challenge to the global trading system because the structure of its economy, even though it has more of a market economy now, is still overwhelmingly dominated by the state, by state and enterprises, and China systematically uh, subsidizes the cost of key imports, energy, access to credit, capital, price of land, and it's kept its exchange rate uh, below fundamentals for some time, although it's appreciating gradually. So what that means is China, even though in many ways it's starting to have a world-class manufacturing sector, uh, is uh, supporting that ambition with a set of policies that are very damaging uh, to not just the commercial and economic interests of its trading partners, but to the political support around the world for sustaining a more open trading system. And that's why it's very important that uh, we get China to move on comprehensively on that front, not just in the exchange rate, but on dialing back those set of subsidies and distortions. I think they're going to have to do it. We'd like them to do it faster and harder uh, and more, in, in a more compelling way. And uh, they are moving on some fronts. We just like them to do more, and we'll, you know, we'll just have to see. I, I think I do think China believes that it's in its interest to try to make this broader system work. Of course, it depends a lot on its access to our market, other markets around the world, and we hope that provides enough of an incentive for them uh, to to make more progress in these reforms. Uh, let's say we have a little time for questions. Uh, let's take some questions. If because of the lights, if um, if you can put your ha your hand way up so that I can see it. Sir. Do yep. you believe today, very, what do you, what's your view on the tension between the relative value of currencies? With all central banks engaging in quantitative easing one way or another between the yen, the euro, and the dollar, and the commodity producer linked to the dollar, basically there is a race to the bottom. At the end of the day, as all are racing to the bottom, you create more uncertainty globally on the fiat currencies and paper currency. What's your view uh, regarding this and the dollar relative to the rest of the currency? I'm not sure this is totally responsive, but I think it's basically right. Um, uh, if you look at the, the broader exchange rate system, monetary system, and the constellation of exchange rates, there's really uh, one big compelling reality, which is that uh, China's currency and the currencies of a bunch of other countries who have tied themselves out of the dollar and therefore to Chinese currency is still below 
uh, almost all measures of fundamentals. And over time, those currencies are going to have to continue to rise significantly further against the major currencies, against the dollar, uh, the euro, and the yen. It's not principally a dollar thing. It's about those currencies against uh, the major currencies. And that's just because of the strength of growth, productivity growth uh, that's happening. And that's going to happen no matter what. Uh, and China's got the interest of making sure that it happens less through higher inflation over time and more through that adjustment. And that's why they let the exchange rate move uh, gradually, not just over the last 18 months, but if you go back five years against the dollar, the Chinese currency is 45%, 40% higher in real terms against the dollar. But it's got some ways to go. Um, and it would be better for the system, the stability of the system, it, for that to happen more gradually. Now, you're also right that for the major economies that have um, very high unemployment and very large uh, output gaps, the unused capacity, uh, for a long period of time, the basic thrust of uh, macro policy where people have the room for maneuver should be at uh, strengthening uh, growth and demand. And that's true in the United States, and it's true in large parts of the continent. Now, not everybody's got the room to do that, but the people who have the room to do that should do that, and that's necessary and desirable and healthy for the broad interests of emerging economies, too, because, of course, uh, they, their, their strength and their future is still substantially dependent on how fast the rest of the world grows. One more question here. Yeah, gentlemen in the front. Uh, you talked uh, quite, a, uh, quite a lot about uh, unemployment. Are you concerned in the long run about the rise of protectionism um, as countries try to protect their markets and shield their people from unemployment rate? Thank you. A absolutely. I mean, I think anybody who, um, who sits in, in, uh, in positions of policy at a time where there's that much basic damage uh, needs to worry about that. And the political pressures around that thing are very high. And I think we've been uh, very successful and very fortunate that relative, you know, not just to the 30s, uh, but even relative to the 1980s, last time U.S. had a pretty deep recession, uh, we've been able to prevent yeah. that uh, huge political pressure translating into a, a material increase in protection in the United States and around the world. If you can just compare the 80s in that context. That's a good thing for the world, a good thing for the United States, but there is a huge pressure out there. And in the United States, as you know, it's very bipartisan. It unifies Democrats and Republicans. And that's why, again, why, in some ways, why it's so important that we're able to demonstrate, not just with China, but generally, that countries are playing by the same rules that we play by. Because that goes to the heart of what drives a lot of the political pressure. Let me ask you a final question. You were surprised that you made news a couple of days ago when you made clear that you were not going to serve in the second term of the Obama administration. Is that his choice or yours? <laughs> That's an excellent way to pose that question. Uh, you know, generally, uh, anybody who takes these jobs serves at the pleasure of the president. And, you know, at a time when we face so much challenge, so much pressure, uh, you know, if the president asks you to do these things, you, you, have, to, you have to do them. Uh, and when, when um, he asked me to stay, when I thought it was the right time to leave, I agreed I would stay. And I agreed I would stay to the balance of his term. And he uh, accepted that um, aspiration of mine. And that's where it's going to come out, I think. What are you going to do next? That feels like a long way away. Uh, you know, again, you know, we're in Europe. I know the eyes of the world in Europe. but. Uh, you know, we are living with uh, terribly challenging and hugely consequential economic policy choices. We have a lot of unfinished business, even on the financial reform side, and, uh, and a lot of foundation laying uh, for better policy outcomes on the things that are good for growth, investment, for opportunity in the United States, not just for the long-term fiscal. So uh, I feel like we've got, a, we've got a long year of hard work. And um, I know it's a political moment in the United States, and people are skeptical about whether we can do anything, but our judgment is that we still have a chance in some of these areas to make some progress, and I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that as long as I can. Tim Guyton, a pleasure to have you. Nice to see you, Fried. Thank you all.